Welcome to the 267th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Jenny Nash, author of the nonfiction book, Read Books All Day and Get Paid for It, The Business of Book Coaching. Stay tuned for the interview. This episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro.fm. Libro.fm is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. Support your favorite local bookstore and you can pick from more than 125,000 audiobooks including New York Times bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know who I'm talking about, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out the recommendations and curated list from the people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. There's a special offer now for reading and writing podcast listeners. Get three audiobooks for the price of one, $14.99, with your first month of membership, just use the code RWPODCAST. Again, that's Libro.fm, purchasing audiobooks from your local bookstore, and use the code RWPODCAST. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Jenny Nash, author of the nonfiction book, Read Books All Day and Get Paid for It, The Business of Being a Book Coach. Jenny, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, so do you read books all day and get paid for it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do, in fact, do that. Yes, I do. Um, if someone listening isn't familiar with the idea of a book coach, can you describe what a book, book coach does for an aspiring author? Yeah, it is a term that is relatively new, and it's a job that's relatively new, actually. And it used to be back in the day, I always think of Max Perkins in the day of, you know, he edited Hemingway and Fitzgerald, or I think of a woman named Ursula Nordstrom, who was a children's book editor, and she worked with Maurice Sendak and E.B. White. And I think of that as sort of the glory days of, of publishing. And in that time, the publishers really were in the business of nurturing their writers and they would, you know, you can read books about this time and, and I've read letters from this time and the editors were really bringing these writers along as creators and also as business people talking to them about what book might sell, what book might they write next, you know, how might they manage the gap between books when they perhaps didn't have money flowing there was it was just much more of a involved process and and as publishing has changed over the years and as our world has sped up that sort of nurturing has just gotten squeezed out of the publishing industry almost completely there's a very rare number of editors who still will do that sort of work with their writers but for the most part publishers are looking for a fast, you know, they want to get something to, to press fast. They want it to be low risk. They want to make sure that it's going to be ready to go and ready to sell. And so the work of nurturing a project or nurturing a career or developing a work over time has fallen to the authors themselves. And, and even with the advent of self-publishing, authors now in that realm have to put together all of the support that they need themselves. So into that world comes a book coach and a book coach is different from an editor. I always think of an editor as somebody who comes in after the fact. So perhaps a draft is done, perhaps several drafts are done and the editor is going to come in and, and help make that work the best it can be. And I, I myself have been edited by extremely exceptional editors at big five publishers, and it is a complete delight. I'm, I'm not throwing editors under the bus. I love mm -hmm. being edited, and they perform a, an incredible and important function for the writer. 
But that's a very different thing than having somebody in the creative process with you while the work is unfolding. And that's what a book coach does. So we commit to being with the writer through all the ups and downs, through the idea stage, through the development stage, through the polishing and revision stage, through the pitching stage, if that's what they're going to be doing, if they're going to be going to traditional publishing. So we we commit to being with them through all of those ups and downs and we we edit and we analyze and we cheer and we commiserate and we hold them accountable. So we're really a, a partner, not of the creative work, but of the creative process. And so so what is your personal background? Did you work with any of the big fives? I did. I had three books of nonfiction published by various big five publishers. And then I had three novels published um, at Penguin. So I was at Simon & Schuster. I was at St. Martin's Press. I was at Penguin. I was all over the place in, and, and I was a solid mid-list writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so your writers will, I mean, your listeners will know what that means. Of course, it, sure. I was, I was not a big deal. I was not making an enormous amount of money. I was doing well. I was, I was making it work and I was very lucky and very grateful, but it, it wasn't going to sustain itself over time. It wasn't going to be a long-term career option for me over time. I couldn't break through to, you know, the big time. Right. Right. Well, given your work as a book coach and the title of your book, I assume that you love reading. What are some of your earliest memories of books and reading? Ah, oh, I, um, I love that question. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I was just that kid that so many, so many writers were, you know, the one that wanted to go to the library all the time and bring home stacks and stacks of books and stayed up late reading and got in trouble because I was reading. And um, I used to read, we used to, my family used to go on long car trips and I would read in the car and I get car sick. <laughs> you know? and, um, just not, not able to stay away from it. I I found the world of reading to be very logical. It's it's a if you think about it when you when you read a book it's a very linear process. You you start at the beginning, you move through and you get to the end and there's always some sort of a a resolution or or I mean there is a resolution and I felt that very strongly as a young reader and I I loved that aspect. It felt like the world was understandable when I was immersed in a world of books. And I had the great pleasure of one of one of the nonfiction books I wrote for um, that I was referring to earlier mm -hmm. is a book called Raising a Reader. So I had a, a, the great pleasure of having two children and raising them to be readers as well. So then I got to revisit all those books that I loved as a child. And be in them with my own kids. And we read books like all the Laura Ingalls Wilder sure. Little House on the Prairie <laughs> books. And I read The Secret Garden and The Little Princess and The Chronicles of Narnia, to, you know, to my kids and, and read them out loud and got to relive some of some of those just incredibly amazing books all the E.B. White books, Trumpet of the Swan and Charlotte's Web. <laughs> you know, it's great. Right, yes. So, so in terms of your own client list as a book, as a book coach, um, what would be the breakdown between um, uh, authors who are pursuing um, traditional publishing deals versus self-published authors? Well, for me personally, my work has gravitated largely toward people seeking traditional publishing deals. Mm -hmm. I, I've been doing this for a while. I've had a great deal of success at it. My clients tend to do very, very well. And so my prices have, have gone up. Sure. And so the people that are going to come to me are going to be very seriously invested in some kind of return on invest investment. And usually that means a traditional publishing deal. I absolutely do work with writers who want to go in a different direction. 
I just recently got to celebrate the launch of a book by Jen Loudon, who is a multiple bestselling author. And she decided to bring a book out with a hybrid publisher. She wanted to control a lot more of the process and own a lot more of the process. And, and I worked with her all the way up until the uh, copy editing stage on that book. Um, so I, I do do both. And, and I, so for me, it's, it's the criteria is just somebody who's, who's very serious about doing their best work for the marketplace. And that's not every writer. Sure. Um, and so do you work with both novelists as well as nonfiction authors? I do. And I always hesitate to say that because in my, in my book coach training and certification program, I hammer very hard on the point that people need to focus and they need to narrow who they work with so that sure. they can best serve that person. So my, my teaching is always narrow your scope of what you're doing and, and become an expert in that realm. And in my own practice, I don't follow my own <laughs> advice. <laughs> are there, are there, I, I'm curious, are there specific, I mean, given that, I mean, if you look at the nonfiction side, are there specific nonfiction areas or genres, so to speak, that you, that you tend to um, focus on or that you feel like you're more adept at? So here's what's really interesting about that question and then what, and your previous question is I, I edit all the things, all the genres, all the mm -hmm. topics, all the things. And what I've come to believe is that there's very little difference between any of it. The, the process of writing a book is the same, almost identical, no matter who's doing it or what they're doing or what sort of expertise they bring to it, or if they're making up a story or if they're basing it on academic research. And, and that's really what my entire business and philosophy rests on is this idea that you can break the it, you can't prescribe it you can't say here's the 10 steps and do the 10 steps in order but you can look at the process and you can say every book writer needs to go through these steps at some point in some order and some might go faster through one step than another or some might do them out of order but the the creative process of book writing is is very much the same. And so I consider myself an expert in that process. And I have worked with people with topics just all over the map. I, I worked with a Wall Street Journal reporter who had a um, beat that was the Virginia coal country and mm -hmm. everything that was going on in that industry. I mean, I knew less than nothing about this, <laughs> about this industry. And, and when he came to me, I said, I said that I don't know a single thing about this. I cannot help you with, you know, understanding if your facts are correct, or if you've covered the research in the correct way, that's not what I'm here for. And, and he said, that's not what I need you for. I know that. And I know people who know that. And, you know, so it's that kind of a situation um, that a novel or a work of nonfiction is the primary thing that a writer has to do is figure out the structure that they're going to use to get their message across. And their message could be a story or their message could be an argument or a, you know, some sort of a um, prescriptive how to book, but it's so much about structure. And that's the thing that I think the vast majority of writers either don't know or willfully ignore. Right. <laughs> well, are there clients that you've worked with that you would love to tell us about? Sure. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I would. Um, I, I'll, tell, I'll tell you about, just to give people a sense or a flavor of, of how this works. Um, I worked with a, a client recently who is also a podcaster like you, a writing podcaster. Her name's KJ Delantonia, and she's the co-host of the Hashtag Am Writing podcast. She was for many years a editor at the New York Times. She was the editor of the parenting column there, and she has written a nonfiction parenting book that did very well and was out in the marketplace. 
And she came to a point in her career where she decided that she wanted to write fiction and she had never written fiction. And she'd had this whole career and this whole series of success in, in a different realm. And, and she was trying it on her own. And that's what most writers do because that's what we're led to believe that writers do. It's the, the, you know, writer in the garret or, you know, sitting alone in the, in the, um, library doing, doing their work. And, and that is the act of writing. You do do it alone and you do, you do do it in a room of your own by yourself. But at a certain point, you need the reader to close the loop for you as a writer. You need, it's like an electrical current. You need to close the loop. And oftentimes when writers are stuck, as KJ was, they, they have not had that feedback loop. They haven't closed the loop yet. So they're just so much in their own head and their own story that they, it's very hard to see what they've done. So when she came to me, she had a, a full draft of, of a novel and it's, um, it's, I describe it as a caper. It's, it's just a really fun kind of caper of a novel. It's, it's about two chicken restaurants and they're going to be on a reality TV show and they each sister, there's two sisters in this family and they each are behind one of the other fried chicken restaurants due to this old family riff. And so there's just all these shenanigans and stolen recipes and you know, all kinds of fun, fun stuff. But this draft that KJ presented to me was really a mess and she's a magnificent writer she kn knows exactly how to tell a story how to spin a sentence these are not things she needed help with she knew her story inside and out I could ask her any question and she would know the answer to it but on the page it was it was just very um heavy is the best way I can describe it, it was heavy it was dense it was circuitous there were all these paths that sort of went off in different directions it didn't have a center it lacked exactly what I was speaking about before it lacked structure right and so what she needed me to help her do is figure out what that structure was going to be and and I think of structure like a container you know for for fiction it's going to be who's telling this tale Whose head are we in? Whose point of view are we in? Where does it begin? Where does it end? Why does it begin there? And why does it end there? How does it proceed? What What are those characters trying to achieve and what's standing in their way? These are all the questions, the logic that's behind everything. So I helped her hammer out the parameters and the structure around those things. And once she got that, those fundamentals set, she was able to make that story just sing within the boundaries that, that we had set. And, you know, that's the thing. Uh, writing a book, it's, it's very much like, I always talk about the game of basketball. Um, the, the game of basketball works because there is a court of a certain measure and the baskets are hung at a certain height and there's rules about how many points you get when you make a basket. And, it thrives within those rules and within those boundaries. And the same is precisely true of, of writing a book. And that process of working with KJ is just a perfect example of it. This was a person who did not need to know how to write. <laughs> she didn't need to know what to write. She just needed help with managing those boundaries of her story and this process of the story. And that novel, she ended up selling, she ended up getting a six figure deal for it. And it's called the chicken sisters. It will be out uh, next month. And um, KJ came back to me then for her second novel. And we started from scratch. And the reason I chose her to speak about, she obviously is a massive success and a well-known person. And that's exciting. But what I, the reason I just picked that story out of the blue was because I think it shows that oftentimes a real pro is the one who knows when they need help and what they need help with. Sure. And, and when she came to me then for the second book, I mean, it has just been the most joyful and um, easy process of helping her build the foundation for that next novel because she knows exactly 
how to do it now, how it works. She knows what she was missing that first time when she wrote that draft and didn't want to make that same mistake again. And so in a very, very short period of time, we were able to help her make those decisions and that structure for the new book. And she was able to just quickly take it and run. And so that that's part, um, that's one story about what a book coach does. And I'll tell one other to, sure. to give a, another side, another side of the story and, and how it also works with nonfiction. So in this case, I will tell you about a woman named Kimmy. And Kimmy came to me the way a lot of writers do on the nonfiction side and the fiction side. And she said, um, I have three book ideas and, you know, I want to write them all. And I'd like some help in deciding what order to write them in. So for her, the, the sort of presenting question was, was a marketplace question, which one of these books might be most likely to sell and which of these might be the best for me to build a career on. She had never written anything. She was um, a counselor in a middle school in Houston, a school counselor, and she has a education degree from Harvard. And she had some thoughts <laughs> <laughs> about about parents and and um, young people that she wanted to share. So she had she had all these ideas. So I helped her talk about why why was she called to write a book? What and why now in her life? And what was going on that was leading her to do this at this time? You know, there's a lot of things you could do with an idea. You could start a business. You could, you know, create a course. You could go on a speaking tour. You could have a workshop. You know, so you really need to ask, why are you even writing a book? And what are you thinking you're going to get out of it? And I helped her with those foundational questions on the nonfiction side. And we selected one of the ideas that she was most excited about and that she could best visualize. And then we did the exact same work that I did with KJ on her novel. It It's, okay, what is the shape of this going to be? What is the container that we're going to make for this idea? And who exactly are you writing it for? What do they need when they come to this book? And that's that's going to dictate where it starts and where it ends and what's going to be in the middle, which is identical to what you do on with a novel. And the in the case of a nonfiction book, the reader is the person going through a transformation. In, in, in a novel, it's the character who's going through a transformation. But in nonfiction, you want your you want to take your reader on a journey. So it's where do they come into this? What do they come in knowing? What do they come in needing? What do they want? How do we get them there? And all the same questions about the writer's voice and style and what sort of, you know, Kimmy really did not want to write an academic book. She wanted to write a book that was based in research, but that was really directed Accessible. toward yeah, really accessible. And and her book is for fathers of teenage girls. And it's about how a dad can talk to her, um, his, his daughter about all the hard things. And her contention, her point, her message is that um, this is the place where families get strong and women get strong and that men have a really big role to play in that work uh, and that and that our culture can benefit that and families and individuals can benefit and and so that that's um we did that work on on structuring the book and then I helped her produce a book proposal and the book proposal is a um marketing document a sales document it's like a business plan for the book mm -hmm. and you use it to go get an agent so we we did all of that work and we I helped her with a strategy for how to pitch and how to position the book and the words to say and how to position herself and all of those questions. And she landed a fabulous agent and she landed a book deal at Penguin. And the reason I chose Kimmy to to tell you on the on the nonfiction side what book coaching is like is because at the same time 
that she was working on this book, she was actually trying to get pregnant and she was going through fertility treatments. And by just a strange twist of the universe's fate, she got the book deal and got pregnant the same week. (laughs) And (laughs) so, so now she was going to have a baby in nine months and she needed to finish a book in nine months. And so she kept working with me and I became um, <laughs> the, the whip cracker that <laughs> kept her on, on track and kept her. We had spreadsheets, we had word counts, we had deadlines, we, we, had, we built in sick days. I mean, we had this massive process that, that was about getting her to that finish line. And um, she very recently had the baby and finished the book, turned the book in and met her deadline. So that, um, that was why I picked Kimmy's story because I think it shows how similar the process is to what, what I did with KJ. And then the way that a book coach is with that writer in it, in a way over time that an editor just can't be. Right. Well, I know that I read that you self published a book and it was a, in, in your words, a total sales failure. How could a book coach have helped you with that? Ugh, it really was. <laughs> um, so, so the story of my my self published novel that was a failure is is a sad one, and and I actually don't think a book coach could have helped me. And and here's why the you know, we're only as good as the questions we ask, I think, as human beings. And people who ask for help the way that my clients do when they hire me or or when they hire one of the coaches I've trained, when somebody asks for help, that's just a huge, a huge action. And it means that they're open to learning. They're open to looking at their own weaknesses. They're open to admitting how much they want success and that they're willing to invest in it. And I was not at the time of this, this particular book's failure. I was not any of those things. I was in fact the opposite. And I think that I was in the place a lot of writers get, which is I sort of thought I was owed success. I thought I was just kind of filled with ego that I didn't have to follow the rules of other people. Um, I didn't believe what I was hearing from the publishing publishing industry about this particular book. I was just very blind. And so I don't think anybody could have saved me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the so what happened was I I had um, a two book deal for for novels um, at Penguin. And as I explained before, they were they were mid list books. They they did fine. They they were out there, and we had a um, option on the next book, on mm-hmm. the third book, and that is when the publisher has written in the contract that they have the first right of refusal on your next book. And I was disgruntled and thinking that I should get more money. And I should be treated more like a breakout top of the list author than a mid list writer. And, and so I, I was working on another novel and I, I did the thing that I now know was my first mistake, which is I thought I can, um, I can reverse engineer what a big selling book should be. And I can study what all the big selling books are and I can produce that. I'm good enough to do that. I should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking at what did I want to write and what was I curious about and what was I good at and what was I interested in, I I just did this, this total, you know, looking at the marketplace first thing. And, and so I wrote a book that, um, I mean, it's not a bad book. It's, it's fine. It's a good book. It's, it just, I'm not really terribly proud of it because of what I know 
you know, how it was made. So, so I wrote this book and we went back to the publisher, you know, on this option and they did not give us the big money that I wanted. They actually offered me a three book deal where each of the next three books was going to be the same amount of money I had gotten on the first two. And, and I, I mean, I had an agent who helped me with this and my agent is completely brilliant and she represents amazing writers with incredible careers. So I do not believe this is at all in, in her court. This is all me. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. I, I'm better than that. So that was the whole ego thing. I, I want more money. I want somebody who's going to treat me like a star, even though, you know, I had not earned the right to think that. Right. And, and so we went out to other publishers to see if we could get more money. And my, my agent had done this with other writers before she, she knew how to do it. She was really good at it. And we ended up with an auction, which is the dream. That's what you want. You want people bidding against you, um, each other, I'm sorry, for the right to publish this book. So we ended up with an auction and it was very exciting. And we had, I think it was somewhere in the neighborhood of six editors who were interested in bidding on, on this book. And we made it really clear that we were looking for big money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because that was what I was about at the time. And, um, the auction day came and nobody bid. Uh. So what that meant was they couldn't get the big money and they were looking at the numbers of my other books and those books didn't support the big money. And, you know, it just, it was a bad day. <laughs> yeah, I, I can so, imagine. So here I am with this, with this book that didn't sell at auction. And, and then I made a series of continued mistakes and, and I said, well, they don't know what they're talking about this. I'm capable of, of having a big book. I will bring it out myself. I will self publish it. And I rushed to bring it to press without doing again, any of the work that you have to do to make a book fly. I, I just had this bizarre notion that I was special <laughs> and that I again didn't have to do what everybody else had to do that I would be you know it's the Cinderella story I would be discovered I would be plucked out the 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 world would rise up and make me a star and it just doesn't work like that and the book I mean, I, I don't even, it's hard for me to even look at it. It's still on Amazon. It's probably sold somewhere <laughs> in the neighborhood of 120 copies, Ouch. you know, uh, maybe more, maybe two, you know, I don't know. Bad though. Bad. Yeah. And, you know, the fact of the matter is that is the reality for most books. If people don't do their homework and put in the time and take themselves seriously Every once in a while, there is a writer that, you know, like, um, oh, there's a huge book. I've not read it, but uh, where the crawdad's saying that just is topping every bestseller list and people are raving about it and all the book clubs are reading it. And and I believe that was the writer's first novel right. and, yep. <laughs> you know, sort of plucked out of obscurity and and a massive success that makes her entire you know, world change. But that's and like winning the lottery. It's totally like winning the lottery. And, you know, where we look at a Stephen King or a JK Rowling and those are the 1% of the 1% and of the 1%. You know, yeah. And <laughs> most people do not have that experience. They do not get a book does not save them from having to do a day job. It doesn't save them from much of anything. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a, a long process. There's a lot of risk and, you know, you really have to know why you're doing it and what your intention is. So that story, that sad story of my book's sad path through the world, um, really informs the work I do. And it's, it's really the reason why I think I'm good at what I do because I know what it feels like and what it looks like to, to not, 
take the steps that you have to take to, to do a good job. So if someone wanted to start a career as a book coach, what would you recommend? <laughs> um, I'm just laughing because it's like such a softball pitch for me to, to hit out of the park park and say, well, come do Author Accelerator's book coach training and certification course, um, which is in fact a thing that I sell and that that I have. Um, I've been training book coaches for five years now in the and, process. And what's, the, what's the way that people can find out about that? Is there a website? Yeah, it's authoraccelerator.com. And if you go to authoraccelerator.com backslash Jeff, I will put some resources on there just for your listeners and they can check it out. We have some free classes and things that you can check out. If you're interested in either hiring a book coach, we, we match writers for free with our certified coaches, or if you want to be a book coach and I can, I can talk, um, you know, not in a salesy way, but just in a way about what I believe a good book coach sure. needs to have. And one of the things that, that I am up on a soapbox about is the a lot of writers and other people like librarians and English teachers and MFA graduates are already doing the work of a book coach. They're just not being paid for it. So they're the people who are always critiquing their friend's work. And they're the people who are leading book clubs and analyzing books and helping other people understand them. And they're the people that everybody goes to to figure out why a novel isn't working or why my book isn't selling. And and they're already kind of got a one foot in this work, but they're just not seeing it as a serious business or a thing that they could do for their life or their career. And so one of the things that I'm always trying to get people to see is that these are skills that are very valuable to writers and that they're very valuable in the marketplace. And if you want to make those skills into a side gig or a career, it is entirely possible to do so. And the skills that that I believe a good book coach needs, it, you know, the first thing would be just mechanical edits. There's six skills. The first one is just the ability to decipher a sentence and do the mechanical edits and follow the Chicago manual of style and and really get those things right. Um, that tends to be, in my mind, the very least important skill. Um, I am terrible at mechanical editing. I I debate with myself every day if I've got my commas in the right place or you know, my right. um, d different things. So it, that's important to to know, but I don't think it's the most critical. And and I think people often think that's the only thing you need, and it's it's really the least thing you need. The second thing you need is some sense of narrative design. So some sense of how readers approach a narrative and how narratives are shaped and structured and why they work the way that they do. So some understanding about that, those principles, whether you're going to coach fiction or nonfiction or both, you need to understand those, those principles of narrative design. The third skill would be an understanding of marketplace realities. So that's how are books bought and sold? How does the money flow? How do authors make their money? What does it cost to get a book published? What does it cost to market a book? What are agents looking for? You know, just a, a whole sense of what our industry is going through. And when you and I are speaking today, we're in the middle of this economic shutdown and just like every other industry, the publishing industry is going through all kinds of changes and bookstores are suffering and publishers are, you know, scattered and their teams are working from home. Um, and you get all kinds of different reports about what's happening in the industry. I, I've heard some reports that from some agents that they, they had their best month ever in the last month, you know, with editors at home and eager to buy and, books doing well. And then I've heard the opposite. So, you know, it's just keeping your, your finger on the pulse of what's going on so that you can guide your writers toward, you know, the place that they want to publish and, and speak with authority about the different ways that they might get their book into readers' hands. The fourth skill a good book coach needs to have is the ability to manage a project. Uh, writing a book is a very complex intellectual undertaking, 
and it unfolds over a long period of time. And a lot of writers are not um, very good or very tuned into this aspect of the work. Um, a good book coach, I mean, I am not a person who uses a Gantt chart or <laughs> um, a spreadsheet very well, but it's that ability to to know how a project unfolds and what needs to happen and what order it needs to happen and when it needs to happen and how are you going to hit a deadline and what are you going to do if the, the writer, you know, their energy flags or something happens in their life, like they get pregnant, you know, and they have to figure it out. So the ability to manage a project is really huge. The fifth skill that I think a good book coach needs is deep compassion for writers. And I refer to that as a skill because I think learning how to give tough feedback with compassion is something you do need to practice and learn. And, you know, I, I believe very seriously that a good book coach has to be honest all the time. They have to tell the hard truths. A lot of writers have never heard the hard truths and they need them in order to grow and succeed. But I'm sure you also know well that writers tend to have traumatic experiences from people bashing their work or tearing them down or, you know, tearing their work apart. And that doesn't do anybody any good. So the ability to deliver honest feedback with compassion is is something that I believe can be learned and and needs to be learned. And I have. I've studied how to do this from people who are much better than I am. Um, I really like Ed Catmull's work in um, Creativity Inc. That's a book about Pixar and Mm -hmm. the beginning of Pixar and the brain trust and how they deliver feedback in their systems. And um, Twyla Tharp's book, The Creative Habit, has a lot of, of um, information on this. And so this is a thing that I believe a good book coach needs and that, and that I try to teach. And then finally, um, digital business savvy, just they, a book coach needs that for their own selves for how to run their own businesses. Our business is very virtual based. It's a wide open universe for writers and writers are all over social media and, and publishing professionals and book coaches need to know how to navigate that universe and, and live in it. And their writers are going to need that too. So some sense of the way the digital universe works and how these businesses work online and some sense of how to, um, price your products and and sell them in this sphere is the the last key skill that I think a good book coach needs. So so what books and authors inspire you and that you go back to and reread either fiction or Uh, nonfiction? Such a, such a good question. You know, it's funny. I, I mean, some of the books I just named on, on the creative, the creative side, um, Creativity Inc. Sure. by Ed Catmull, The Creative Habit by Twyla Tharp. I always return to those books again and again. I'm a big reader of business books, which um, is kind of an unusual thing for a creative person or a writer, but I I really enjoy reading everything from um, business memoirs, like Phil Knight's book, uh, Shoe Dog, about Nike, it's a great book. <laughs> and, um, I return to books like that. Um, Have you read and, Bad and, Blood? I'm sorry? Have you read Bad Blood? I've never even heard of it. What is it? Oh, it's the book about Theranos. Oh. Uh, the, the blood oh. testing company. It was written by a Wall Street Journal reporter. It's really good. I like tore through it in like a day. Oh, I'm getting it. Bad yeah. Blood. <laughs> yeah, that's by the, that's about the woman. I don't remember her exactly, name. Exactly. Right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, the fraud and everything. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, I love books like that. So I I read um my recent one that I'm sort of obsessed with is a book by Paul Jarvis called Company of One, and it's about building a business without scaling. So it's kind of the anti-scale business book and. He's kind of a maverick in that regard, and it's fabulous for for book coaches. So um, I also like Made to Stick by the uh, Chip and Dan Heath. 
Um, Seth Godin's marketing books, um, like This Is Marketing, his recent one. So I'm, I'm reading all the business books all the time. I love them. Um, and then fiction, I tend to return again and again to books that have incredibly beautiful structures. So um, it's not actually fiction, it's memoir, but I think of Cheryl Strayed's Wild. I probably talk about that book once every few weeks just because it has a really powerful and unique structure and it's a great book to teach from because of that. That's a good book. Um, yeah, so so I, I return to, to those books that have um, those kind of structures. And sometimes the books that I return to again and again are not necessarily the the best books. They just are the ones whose structures are so clear that everybody can see them. So there's a book that I, I frequently talk about, Jodi Picoult's novels, because she does a really good job of multiple point of view characters moving a story forward. So I'll talk about her books a lot and point people to them to to study the structure. So I'm just a structure nerd, really, when it comes to, to fiction. And um, it means I can't, I'm a really bad reader now, because all I can see is the structure. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll talk about what a beautiful structure a book had. And people are like, but it was a great story. <laughs> <laughs> great. Well, that's all the questions I had. I'm not sure if you had anything that you wanted to add. This has been a good conversation. Oh, my gosh. It was, um, I felt like I said all the things. It was, it was fun. You asked really good questions. And I would just refer people to authoraccelerator.com backslash Jeff. That's J-E-F-F, -F, your name. And yes. um, I'll put some resources on there for writers who are interested in, in doing some of that strong foundational work at the beginning of their book. I have some free resources for that and resources about being matched with a book coach. And if anybody feels called to do this work that I describe, I just love it. I you know, you asked at the beginning, do I really read books all day and get paid for it? And I really do. <laughs> and and I, uh, it, I just giggle because it's just so much fun. And, and I get to help people's dreams come true. And to be honest, a lot of people ask me, well, when am I going to go back to writing myself? And do I ever itch to do it? And the answer is really no. I I love what I'm doing now so much. I feel I'm better at it than I was as a writer. And I'm not going to say I'm not going to go back, but it's this is a really good time. <laughs> Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Jenny Nash, author of Read Books All Day and Get Paid for It, The Business of Being a Book Coach. Go buy a copy of the book now. And Jenny, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks for having me. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. The holidays are doubly important this year, so make your celebrations doubly special. At Kroger, we've got a huge selection of high-quality meats on top of fresh, natural produce, like fresh, never-frozen prime-grade beef and our Simple Truth Organic Brussels sprouts, or delicious king crab legs with our private selection gourmet potatoes. Whew, had to say that doubly fast. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Get more ways to save at the Buy 5 or More Save $1 each sale. Just buy five or more participating items and save a dollar each with card. Kroger, fresh for everyone.